Hey everybody. All right. We are going to look at the fourth roast today. And this one is going to be a Burundi. And um, I'm hoping to have this one end at like 398 finish roast temperature. Um, uh, you know, when you get to the range, um, you're getting down below 400s and you're 398 around there, 396, 398. Um, you're getting to a spot in the roast where you have a chance to really develop sweetness, but the brightness of the cup and the, the flavor that's intrinsic to these beans is like at, I think it's, um, it's brightest and clearest. So um, this method that I'm doing in this video, I am trying to, to maneuver it in a way that we have a, all the acidity is there and present and available while we have roasted it long enough to, to have this sweetness. And this is, you know, a 398 Burundi is one of my favorite cups of coffee to drink. And um, with this method, um, it really, it, it's, a, it's a great tool to have uh, in roasting to be able to have sweetness and um, leave that acidity bright and shining and clear. So I hope you enjoy it. Hey people. All right, we got another batch here for you. And what we're gonna try to work on this time is uh, we're gonna have the finish roast temperature be a little bit lower than last one we did, which is a 407. And we are gonna move down to the 390s. And we're gonna go to 398, um, maybe 396. 396 and 397 and eight kind of have their own thing happening in there that I'd like to bring this Burundi to. Um, I, I look at roasting and these finished roast temperatures as um, like a, a physical space that you're, that you're like arriving at. So if you're starting in one spot and you're picking up these beans and you're roasting them and you're, you're walking forward at a specific speed in a specific you know direction and trajectory to get to that spot and um, if we were walking in a line 40 you know 372 would be here and 385 is here and 395 is here and 415 and 420 so you're you're actually physically getting to a spot and around that spot there are these different flavors that are available and it's different like it's it's a specific place to bring these beans to and then your work when you're roasting the kind of like artful expression is how are we getting there are we are we running to that spot are you um are you slowly walking there are you know like what's the path that you're taking so with these beans with this burundi uh which i love burundi i mean like people East African coffees always have something really special, whichever you go to, like Ethiopia, Kenya, Rwanda, Burundi, Tanzania. Um, I think Burundi are my favorite. I mean, like, I love Ethiopia. I love Kenya. I love Tanzania. I love, you know, um, Burundi is so small. The country is so small. And there's something that's so unique and particular about the coffees that come out of there that when you find one that they're just they they have this thing to them that it's hard to even explain but i love burundi coffee so um now this one i'm going to bring to a, that 398 and how i'm going to do it is by kind of doing this really this big um like lob i'm, I'm going to use a bunch of force right away i'm going to keep the high i'm going to keep the um the flame at its max until I get to the finish environmental temperature that I want to get to. 
So how that's different from other roasts, like other roasts that I've shown, I am in, I am doing a lot of heat right at the beginning, and then I'm I'm backing off the heat as we go gradually. We're going nice and slow and easy. Now with these beans, I want to push them, and I'm going to push them very hard, and I'm going to push them all the way through the first phase. Okay, so the drying phase, while they're still green, I'm going to have high heat, and I am trying to get up to my finish environmental temperature within the first phase. Now, the beans are gonna turn yellow and begin entering the browning phase, the second phase, and at that point, I'm gonna make a drastic move. I'm gonna pull the flame out from underneath it. I'm gonna begin to open up the airflow after the environment adjusts from the flame. The environment is gonna adjust, and then I'm gonna begin to open up air. And what I'm trying to do here is give enough force to get up to 398. I'm trying to not use that force in the part of the roast that I think is gonna compromise the flavors that I want to preserve. And I'm gonna use airflow then to manipulate the, the environmental temperature. And I'm gonna do all that and get ourselves up to that 398. Um, hopefully this huge, nice arcing move. Um, push them when they can be pushed. Don't, don't like bother them when they have the flavor components, just they're doing their thing, compounds are coming together and making new compounds, this whole thing happening, I want that to be preserved. So how I'm gonna achieve this is by, I have to think, I have 4.7 pounds of coffee, okay? Now, I'm looking at where do I want to begin? If that's how I want to do this move, where do I need to begin? Well, I know I want to push these things hard, so I'm actually going to begin my charge. Temperature is going to be lower than where it has been before. I have, I, I don't have a max batch, okay? So I have 4.7 pounds and I'm around the 350s and I am just going to turn it up hot so I can push it freely and not be concerned about too much heat and I just want to let it go. So we're going to start in the 350s and put the beans in the hopper. And we are about to begin. Ready, go. All right, beans are going in. Turning up that heat, 10 inches of flame. And we are going. Okay. Now, Every machine is different. Every machine is different. And, um, you, you know, you, the thing that you got to know, if you want to make great coffee, you have to know your machine. And I mean, whether it's like a, a popcorn popper or whether that is um, a small roaster, like home roaster, or whether that is like, um, you know, like a... a a machine that's around this size, sample roaster to like huge production machines. It doesn't matter. You've got to know your roaster. Um, it, it's like if you were a race car driver, like you've got to know your car. You have to know how to maneuver it. Um, how is it that I get this machine to do the things that I specifically want this batch to do? Um, for me, the, the way that I roast and the things that I have in my head are balance. Like I'm always seeking balance. And, and I know that that is not how everybody wants to drink their coffee or how everybody wants to roast their coffee. Um, again, coffee is art. It is not objective. It's not objectively, this is the best coffee there is. It doesn't work like that. Like some people like coffees that taste like that. Some people like coffees that taste like that. These, these flavors are characteristics that's found in this cup. Those people think that that's the worst thing you could ever have, and these people think it's the great. So, it's it's art, it's taste, it's opinion, and so so. You got to just fill in that space and let it be what it is. And and and, for me, it is. I want to have a cup that is balanced. Whether there is, um, it's super light and super bright. I still want sweetness. I still, and now it can't be as sweet, but I want there to, to be, you know, some depth to it and not just thin and piercing. And when I go higher in the roast spectrum and I'm getting to like uh, 420, 421, 424, you know, for me, I feel like that's like 
those, you know, you're getting on this edge of like compromising the bean and the flavor. And it, you know, when you keep going higher and higher, it doesn't matter what bean you have in the roaster because you're burning everything that it, that there is and what it has to offer and what is intrinsic to the, the to the bean is disappearing. You're roasting it right out of it. So I don't like to go really high. I don't like dark roasts. I, I even if I'm roasting something to a point in which there is smokiness, the the approach to that is such that leaves the cup having smokiness and sweetness and full. It's balanced. It's, so. I'm always seeking for balance in the, my profiles and in the way that I am attempting to maneuver. So how I achieve that is I have to know this machine. I have to know the tendencies. I have to know it's the what it is really good at doing. I have to know where its limitations are. I have to know what it can't do. And um, you know, I've roasted on San Franciscans, SF25s, old ones and new ones. I roasted on ProBots, like old UGs, UG22s. Um, I've roasted on Dietrich, And each one is different. And you just have to, you have to learn what the machine has to offer. Now, something that the Dietrich does, which I, I utilize a lot in the way that I roast because I think it's a huge component to this machine, is the airflow. I mean, how you use your airflow and its relationship to your flame is massive. Now, when I roasted on the San Franciscan and on the ProBot, we never adjusted the airflow. It just, you just set it and it's kind of like, that's where it is. Now, those machines, you could do that because there is plenty of airflow to them. They're a continual batch roasting machine, so you've got plenty of, you know, everything's good on that front, and they have a lot of power. And so because of that, you, you can move these beans, um, maneuvering them, like, very freely without concern. Um, with this roaster, um, you can get to that space where, where you could just set the airflow in one spot and just do everything with your flame control, but I find the IR, the infrared uh, burners, which are in Dietrichs, not to be as just like powerful. Like just, they don't have that like raw, brutal, like turn it up, these beans are going. Like it, it doesn't have that ability. But um, that's not necessarily like a downside. I mean, once you pull back the mass, so change your, your weight of beans that you're throwing, and then adjust charge temperatures and adjust, you know, kind of what you're trying to do, you can achieve a very similar taste that you'd get from these other machines. But the thing is, is it's not the same. Dietrich and this Dietrich does what this Dietrich does. It's not the same as the other ones. Now, I'm gonna stop for one second. I'm gonna talk about where these beans are. We're just entering into the, the browning phase. They're just starting to yellow. So my hope was to push these things hard until this point, which I've done. So what I'm about to do is I'm going to slowly bring back the gas. So pulling back the flame, nice and easy. I'm going to, over 30 seconds, so it's six minutes right now. We, we are full on into the second phase, six minutes. I'm going to bring this flame down over 30 seconds. And what it, the point of this is to do is to let that environment slowly change decrease that heavy pushing that I've been doing on this, these beans and get this thing to sit at, at a spot, the environmental temperature to sit at a spot where it is hopefully going to rest for the rest of the roast, okay? Now, I can hear the, the change in the way that the beans are shuffling on the drum, which tells me that that is the spot temperature-wise. I, I don't need to pull back anymore right here okay so we made the pull back we pull back that big push now the flames are way down there is an intrinsic push and force that is inside of those beans they are wanting to continue to increase even though i'm not pushing it with flames now what we're going to do now is we're going to let that carry that that movement up and then as we're beginning to approach first crack i am going to begin to open the airflow. Now, what I noticed is that I needed to 
increase my flame setting a little bit more to try to hold the environmental temperature. I brought it down low. I'm, I'm wanting it to, I'm okay with these movements. I'm okay, typically I would be making a movement with my flame and I'm not, I'm just moving it and I'm gonna let it be this time. I'm making movements and I'm gonna keep moving it because what I'm trying to do is find that spot. It's like balancing act, like you're on a tightrope of where is it that, that the environmental temperature is not decreasing. It's holding steady. And I know I'm about to open up the airflow. And so when I do that, it's going to, again, like it's, it's air to a fire. It's gonna, it's gonna increase. I'm just gonna do, just crack. It's weird, like in, the environment inside of a drum, once you become attuned to it, you realize that there is this like force. It's like a magnetic pull. It's like um, winds in a sail. You're, you're like, there is a force that is locked between the air and the flame and the beans. And every time you twist or open or adjust one of those components, that environment, which is like, has a force holding it together, you're, you're breaking it and you're, 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 you're affecting how this thing is going to, how it's going to like uh, move forward from here. So I made this huge change and I want to take advantage of that spot, you know, um, I want to take advantage of this while the change is, is happening and it hasn't really locked in yet again. I want to, to, to maneuver right into this one position with the environment that, that allows the beans to do what I want them to do. When I look at these numbers here, so here we go, 918, 919, 364, 432, and this is slightly increasing, which I do want. If I'm gonna go anywhere with this, I want it to slightly increase because I have more room. I can go higher with this, and I don't want things to stall out. So having it just slowly increase. Now this is going up by two tenths, two tenths. Okay, two to three tenths. Right as we're entering the first crack, which is excellent, we are now like, going to just open up the airflow a little bit. We're going to help first crack come in, which is happening. We've got our airflow and our airflow is going to be a major factor of what's, a, what's going to be actually controlling the environmental temperature. I'm not controlling it by flame. I'm controlling it by my airflow at this point. First crack is happening. 10 minutes, 12 seconds. So it was like six minutes, 15 seconds when we were getting into the yellowing or fully into it. So we've been in the second phase for around four minutes, okay? So now we're just gonna take note, four minutes for, and so now we're now thinking about developing and the where, how long is that development phase in relation to our second phase? How, how long is that third in relation to the second phase? And you know, at this point, it's, it's, I wouldn't, even if I had expectations of how I wanted that, that last phase to be for development, I'm not gonna make changes to the environment or the air drastically to try to get my time to match up with what I thought needed to happen. You know, if I wanted something to be different, I needed to make different choices way back earlier. Now, there's no, I, you know, I'm only gonna ruin this roast if I start making major adjustments trying to do something that I thought that I was hoping to do. What I am gonna do now, I'm at 388. We're you know, a minute into the first crack and I'm, I'm looking at this going, all right, I got about 10 degrees, under 10 degrees and I'm really wanting to open up this airflow because I want this development to happen. So that is going, I'm opening up the airflow. I'm gonna see it on my environment. Environmental temperature is gonna begin to fall which is fine. It's not falling every second. It's like every other second it's falling or so, which is cool. First crack has just ended happening. I'm gonna open up my airflow even more and I'm gonna just ride out this, you know, we're gonna be, we're gonna be at like between 12.15 and 12.30 for the roast time. And we're gonna be right at that three and I can smell it from here. The thing is getting nice and sweet. Really, really delicious smelling. Yeah, that's nice. Okay, so we're at 390, 
398, 12 minutes, 22. Sweet. And this batch just was beautiful. I mean, this is like exactly what I was hoping for. We had, you know, four-ish minutes in the, in the browning phase, two minutes, which is really nice. Like, you know, the difference between a minute and a half in development and two minutes in development is significant um, in terms of, you know, what's happening with the flavors, what's happening with the body, what's happening with the sweetness, where is the acidity sitting at? You know, if we're, if we're drinking a cup and there's sort of, you know, pr prominent aspects to the flavors, um, one minute into development, if you were to drop your batch right there into the cooling tray, your acidity is and bitterness is going to be very present and very prominent and sitting right in the forefront. And the other flavors are going to sit back. And the thing about it is, too, like when I talk about in the Maillard reaction, you've got um, compounds coming together and creating other compounds. Now, as you are going, you know, you're like making um, like generations of compounds as you're going down the line. Now, if you were to drop it right here, these are the compounds which are, which you have like the generation five that you've gotten into. Those are the ones you've dropped and these are the ones that you're tasting. Well, if you keep going, you're getting a totally different set of things. Now, you aren't going to lose all of the character of those things that were happening at a minute in when you're two minutes dropping it. But um, it's the volume is toned down and some of those compounds have like gone altogether, the, the amount, the quantity that's in the cup, and they begin to drastically, you know, a minute and a half or two minutes or two and a half minutes into development, you result at a very different combination of compounds and flavor and what's the, the presence and the relation to the other things in that cup. And um, this batch here, I'm, you know, I love this Burundi and I'm, I'm pretty excited about uh, this 398 and um, the way that we got there, I think really is gonna give us a, a cup of coffee that is super bright, really like big body, like smooth undertones with this just huge shimmering acidity laying on top of it. And, um, and uh, pretty great. So thanks for watching, everybody.